Uh, give me permission to record. You have to give me permission to record. I don't know how to do that. It's allow recording time. anyway. Allow record. Allow record. Yeah. You guys are looking at the two worst IT technicians in the whole country put together. My name is Sujatha Tyagi. This is Vinit Masram, popularly Hello, known everyone. as Cinema Beyond Entertainment. And we've been trying to get this Zoom call started, and I'm not exaggerating for one hour and twenty-two minutes. One hour and twenty-two minutes. We've been putting this together. Some absolutely trivial reasons. For whom? For you guys. We're doing this for you guys. Why? Because I promised very foolhardily, foolhardily uh, many weeks ago, that we will make a video on Paul Thomas Anderson's filmography. So, this is what we are talking about. I think June se baat kar rahe iske mein. and yeah. now it is time we have finally come together. Thanks, Vinit, for your time. Thank you. No, no, no. Thank you. Thank you very much. Welcome to the cinematic universe of Paul Thomas Anderson. PTA, as he is popularly known, I am a new follower. I am a new fan, and I am entirely obsessed. Vinit, when did you first discover Paul Thomas Anderson? Two thousand seven, when uh, There Will Be Blood came out, uh, and that was the time when I was. Actually, trying to get through to the filmography of Daniel Day Lewis, ah. I did not know much. I did not know much about uh, Paul Thomas Anderson at all. In fact, from the first film onwards, I'm a fan. So this is a conversation between a novice who's just newly introduced to the magic of Paul Thomas Anderson cinematic universe, and somebody who's followed him for years. Weirdly enough, one of his earliest projects, a grainy little YouTube. a uh, video which is a short film called cigarettes and coffee not coffee and cigarettes wait which one is the other one which one is the feature length film jim jarmusch right uh, the other uh, jim jarmusch is coffee and cigarettes coffee and cigarettes so pta made a film called cigarettes and coffee and uh, somehow i had watched that which is like the weirdest thing ever and then after i watched phantom thread recently i went back to watching all his films starting from his first feature hard eight and now he's making one with that really pretty uh, actor kya naam hai bradley cooper bradley, bradley cooper. cooper it's a coming of age uh, film based in the 70s that's what the synopsis says about the film wow so basically ranbir kapoor and imtiaz ali <laughs> in the 70s uh which was your favorite paul thomas anderson film and why there will be blood all time uh, paul thomas anderson film uh, for me uh, i also consider it not only his best film although he thinks uh, i'm like for him the master is his best work uh, for me it will always be there will be blood paul thomas anderson's best work and the best film of the century so best far. film of the century of 100 years yeah. not 100 years since 2000 onwards so 20 Achha, years of this century uh, that we're living in right now the we are living in right now uh, since yeah. the turn of the century there will be blood is the best film and i'm not saying it because that was the first film i saw Uh, because i must have seen there will be blood now more than 30 times yeah. easily the aura of that film starts from the very first shot itself like uh, i saw that film in 2007 and in that time i was still consuming most of the popular films both hindi south indian also some of very little but still uh, commercial stuff uh, and yeah. even in english uh 2000 2006 7 that batman had just come out uh, spider man was popular harry potter was popular in all of those cinema when i saw a single man just digging and hitting at a wall for 5 minutes and trying to get out of there and try to make a living and all of that goes on for fi- first 15 minutes and not a single line of seconds. dialogue yeah 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 not a single line of dialogue and i was yeah. i i all of a sudden like realized like this is something special and that special thing kept going on and on and on for next two and a half hours like it's the most novelistic movie uh, one can make right uh, it's equivalent to a dense epic novel and, and it is an epic film although it's only about a single uh, two characters yeah but it's still a quintessential american epic we'll go about the themes that the movie sure. has in detail as we explore his uh, thematic uh, labyrinth throughout his filmography all the films that he was making before there will be blood felt like he was trying to get enough hands in filmmaking so that he can finally make a movie which is there will be blood so every single theme that he was exploring the most nuanced version of those themes was in there will be blood his style uh, filmmaking style his storytelling style changed completely Yeah. and like it's almost like every single film was a refined version 
of his storytelling style so that finally he can present it in there with big bad yeah what about you what about you i thought it was the phantom thread 2017's film because um, i'm very distressingly attracted to people like uh, woodcock who are just just bad people but i found uh, daniel day lewis very attractive in that film kind of broken but also put together controlling but also extremely submissive it's a beautiful wonderful character and daniel day lewis is, yeah. has done it so well but then i watched magnolia mm. his uh, paul thomas anderson's 1999 epic what is it, it it's epic. like 3 hours long that film it's a 3 hour long film this is longest film it is insane how much i love that film on my first viewing and i think for a lot of people paul thomas anderson's <laughs> work is in a uh, it, it kind of grows on you when you watch it again and then you read about it again yeah. and then you watch it again and then it grows on you and it just kind of you know uh, spreads in your brain and then claws and then just kind of sits there in your brain Magnolia had me on on the first viewing. I was involved in the film. I loved and hated the characters, some of them. I love the random song sequence. I love the reign of the frogs, the setting, the expanse, the interconnectedness of the stories. It is fascinating to me how one writer director manages to put forward so many different characters who have limited screen time julian moore has only very few scenes in the film but in yeah. those film in those small short scenes you know everything there is to know about this character so there he takes yeah. stereotypes and then he gives them personality i thought that was masterful the way he did it he was very young when he did it another another great film with fantastic opening sequence those first 10 minutes when he's explaining the coincidences and like do they have any consequences uh, yeah. in the in the in the fate of all these people who are is it destiny everything so he's building up the entire film based on those first 10 minutes and the way he subverts that uh in the final uh, reign of four frogs and then ultimately you don't get the ending that stereotypically uh you're supposed to get in the first two films at least he was subverting the norms of storytelling the narrative fiction in cinema at that time he started to in a heavy duty way started to push those narrative boundaries from uh punch drunk love onwards still phantom thread his the most important film, one of the most important filmmaker at the moment not just for what kind of stories he trying to tell but the way he's trying to tell like there is no you can't expect oh i know what a paul thomas anderson film is because he's exploring so much and he's trying to push his own limits and the limits of the medium especially the narrative limits of uh, cinematic storytelling with every subsequent film he's he has said that the master is his favorite film and the master is my least favorite paul thomas anderson film i just <laughs> it's my second is my second favorite paul thomas anderson uh but anyway so what we're doing guys is that because vinith and i have been discussing uh, paul thomas anderson for a while this is going to be a very indulgent video it's going to be very long so strap in buckle in and uh, maybe watch this on a sunday when you have nothing else to do uh we have um taken a few observations that we both made uh throughout the cinematic universe of paul thomas anderson there's patterns there is uh obvious patterns there is not so obvious patterns there's absurdities there is um his use of music and uh, that's what we are going to talk about right now and we're going to go pattern by pattern uh so the first pattern which is the most obvious pattern that you find in all nearly all paul thomas anderson films is the desire for an ideal father figure is a is a very personal thing to him also because he's spoken uh, about his relationship with his father in interviews and his father was also in show business you see the short film that he made the grits and coffee uh which eventually went on to become hard eight his first feature film uh it is about a man who ha- has no father and who has lost his mother hard eight i'm talking about and he yeah. needs to make 6000 dollars for his mother's funeral and then this man just shows up his name is sydney he's a mysterious character we don't know where he come he's come from why he's helping out this stranger played by john c reilly why is he teaching him how to gamble and things like that and as the film progresses you you realize that it is a mutually beneficial relationship i think hard eight might be or one of the top most obvious films for this theme that he explores the the yeah. the, the search for an ideal father figure what do you think i would i would just add uh, in terms of 
the desire for not only just ideal father figure, but also in a sense like a uh, family, a desire for a family. That's a whole uh, different thing. The desire for a family, yeah. a surrogate family, वो तो वो एक और अलग ही चीज़ है. Whole other thing. Yeah. So what uh, uh, his desire for ideal father, which is uh, John C. Riley's character, uh, leads him to believe uh, in Sydney. But as you said, the mutual beneficial factor that comes in that we get to know later in the film. That entire sub, that entire plot, the main plot of the film, is riddled more by the guilt that Sydney has for the actions he has done, uh, knowingly or unknowingly, uh, with John C. Riley's uh, family, and that is what connects them. So it's more than father figure helping out a kid. It's more done out of guilt, and that layering makes this entire relationship uh, quite interesting. Uh, and considering. the kind of money he had and the kind of uh, uh, the pressure he had from the studio side also while making the film i think as a first feature length film is is one of the best uh, debuts and you know and you understand like it says like all the great filmmakers make only one film all throughout their career yeah and paul thomas anderson had planted all the themes he's going to explore throughout his career so far in that first film itself so what you see in subsequent movies is more and more nuanced version of the same themes and the same uh, ideas yes you will find the genesis genesis of all his later ideas in hard eight yourself yeah the the promiscuous uh, girl uh, female character played by gwyneth paltrow yeah the Mayan. the the pair bonding the friendship between two male counterparts that also turns out to be a competition later in the film which is the character between john c riley and uh, And who's that? Uh, Jules, the guy who played. How can I forget his name? Samuel Jackson. Yeah. Samuel L. Jackson. <laughs> <laughs> Did you just forget Samuel L. Jackson? I I, uh, I know him by J- Jules more than Samuel L. Jackson. Well done. <laughs> uh, so him and the regret, the the the, uh, the guilt and the regret factor that that is explored more in the other films in. far better way compared yeah. to uh, uh, hard eight but hard eight is definitely the film at which you in which you see the big themes being planted and presented yes in your face yes he was making his first win he was 25 or 26 can you imagine i hate that i hate that he was in his mid 20s what were, what were we what were we doing when we were 25 26 <laughs> i was playing top 10 songs of the week on the radio which is also not a bad way to be but just you it gives you such an insight into the mind of a mid 20 20s lad who has poured everything that his life has taught him so far into his very first film it is yeah. complicated it is nuanced the characters are weird and some of them are real some of them are unreal hard eight unfortunately Absolutely. is not available to watch legally anywhere in india but if you uh, guys would like to see where hard eight the uh, eight genesis came from uh, go to youtube and look for cigarettes and coffee uh, you'll find many many characters in that short film that eventually appear in hard eight and that film is, is, yeah. is fascinating unto itself and he was even younger when he made that and then he took it around to film yeah. i think his first short film he made he was when he was 17 ऐसे और ये डेमन शेजल जैसे लोग ना मुझे बड़ा गुस्सा आता है इनके बारे में सोच सोच के how you're making this okay so obviously to quickly go through this theme again then we come to boogie nights one of his boogie most nights. popular films which yeah. uh, put mark walberg very firmly on the map on the map he put him on the map finally uh, yeah. the recognition that he deserved got it uh, through hard it became an established hollywood director and all those things that we had seen in hard it returned um, in uh, in boogie nights and more some of the themes especially the aspect of american culture and not an overarching american culture but the beauty of his films is he takes this one slice of an american culture and american time period yeah, yeah. and goes deep into that yeah and what he did with that 80s golden generation of american porn industry yeah and he flipped it i ha- i have not studied or anything uh, regarding if there were movies made on porn industry around that film yeah but if you watch uh, boogie nights that's the least uh, representation of a porn industry that you will you you will imagine 
yeah. uh, while you go and watch this film. Yeah, that is another theme that we will come to later. How his films have a lot of respect for the for the job, for the vocation that they are talking about. And Boogie Nights is also one of them. He's not looking down upon the porn film industry at, not all. at all. He's celebrating it and he's... Uh, He's congratulating everybody on the hard work that goes into making these films. Uh, but again, you know, coming back to our pattern that we're observing here, the father-son relationship uh, yeah. is also very obvious in Boogie Nights. Uh, moving on to the next film that also talks about this is Magnolia, my favorite PTA film. And in Magnolia, it's in every plot line. Every single plot line. Every single Even the plot central, line. The central conflict between ja Mackie and uh, his father, that yeah. drives the entire picture. And if you guys have not watched uh, Magnolia, you're in for a surprise because this is Tom Cruise like you've never seen Tom Cruise do anything else. Tom Cruise is this Akshay Kumar style movie star, right? He's a, he's a, he's the biggest movie star. He does action and he does all his stuff. You have to watch him in Magnolia to see a completely different uh, side of the actor and the kind of performances that he's capable of doing. Or he did earlier on in his he career. Did. Magnolia has like some four or five uh, ma- main plot lines and all of them are about a father-son relationship. Each and every single one. And it's, it's a very stereotypical uh, way of presenting this particular uh, conflict. An older man on his deathbed all of a sudden has regrets and realizes, oh, there is a mistake that I had made and now I have to find some sort of redemption. So I need to find the son. Very age-old story. But the beauty has been, uh, in, especially in this uh, relationship, he's not trying to sentiment, make it sentimental. The fact that it's just a chance occurrence. Because he, uh, if you watch the film, in the first 10 minutes, he presented this entire thing like, it all depends on the chance. Uh, it's not about somebody thinks about this for years and years and long, and then it they make it happen. No. An odd conversation just makes uh, Philip Seymour Hoffman dial some numbers yeah. and see if I can get in connection, uh, connect, uh, I can connect with the guy. Yeah. And he yeah. does. However, within that short slice of time, his entire year-long regret and the absentee of his father figure, which he has denied all his life and made this some sort of uh, larger-than-life, hyper-masculine figure of himself, shatters the moment he is in front of his father. Yeah, it's really astounding how that scene plays out when... TJ Mackey meets his father, sees that his father is dying and in one moment forgets everything, forgives him and in the second moment he's back up again. He's pissed off with him again because he spent his whole entire life hating on his father, overcompensating for the fact that there was no male figure in his life. So he's become a men's rights activist and he's, he's protecting all the men and he wants men to destroy women, not even like, I mean, it's, you know, misguided enthusiasm. In that moment, because before this, the film is looking down upon him because he's doing these chest thumping speeches in front of an audience of men and telling men how to date women and dump them. And in that moment, when he meets his father, he becomes human. And then we're not looking yeah. down upon him anymore. We are, when we anymore. find out why he is, how he is, we are sympathetic towards him. And it's just amazing. It's fascinating. It's amazing. It's like a, a very hateful character, the way he's presented in the first few seats, fantastically choreographed and written long dialogues, uh, long speeches uh, yeah. that Tom Cruise fantastically played. All of that flips the moment we realize uh, his past and the moment we, and that interview scene uh, when we get to know who really he, who, yeah. who really TJ Mackey is. Yeah. From that point onwards, it's fantastically in a glamorous way you present a character who is despicable probably the most despicable character within that entire ensemble. And then you make me like him at the, yeah. at the end of it. You yeah. make me say, oh shit, like it's not that bad. Not that yeah. bad of a person. That's what he does. No, he doesn't judge uh, when he's no. making these characters. He picks up on stereotypes and he makes them human. Makes them human. Punch Drunk Love Me Mujhe Mili Nei Thim. Did I miss it or uh, no, it's just no, not there. No, no, uh, it's not there because he's trying to, he's introducing a whole new theme, uh, which is the maternal figure. Uh, how dominating the same maternal figure can be in yeah. Quench Drunk Club is the sisters that he lives with. We don't know, we'll come to that. We'll come to that. We are going to come to that <laughs> pattern next. All right. Out and out father figure and the desire for an ideal father sort of stops uh, at Magnolia. And now he's trying to diversify that theme itself because when we go to 
there will be blood yes it's not just about father uh, but also about the entire family hw is sort of adopted by uh, daniel plainview yeah uh, so he becomes his surrogate father yeah. but is he really a father is he really somebody who wants to take care of hw that something has never been clear there are because there are conflicting uh, scenes uh, mm. the way the relationship of hw and daniel plainview uh, takes place like the moment he is he is uh, he, he goes deaf he feels like he needs to get, put him away because he's no longer helping him in my business yeah however there is a great uh, mourning in that scene when he's uh, letting him go yeah uh, in the train sequence he sheds a tear also uh, when he comes back and he's constantly reminded that he's abandoned his child there is this this great anger uh, because he know that he did wrong so yeah. the first thing he does after he builds the pipeline is call his son back but then he abandons him again the moment he goes against him so what exactly is the investment of this father to his surrogate son is something that nobody can say that we understand and at the same time he is also longing for a long lost family another thing that enables him to let go of hw is this arrival of a person who all of a sudden comes out of the blue and says i am your brother uh, there is a photograph this is the these are the notes and everything and he believes him so he becomes the connection with his family that he never had yeah. and that allows him to leave hw yeah yeah so when he kills this fan and then again he's there's spoiler. that familial void uh, we are talking spoiler that's right <laughs> that familial void uh, is left open he yeah. needs his uh, surrogate son back so his quest for family more than capitalism and the greed aspect of there will be blood yes it's there but it's more as a backdrop the real story is about his struggle to have some sort of a family and you know i think after magnolia for pta and i mean i don't know i could be truly talking out my butt here his personal life changed in a big way so before mm-hmm. this before he was in the search for a father after this it became a father's search for children in a manner of speaking to expand mm-hmm. their family because 2007 is when there will be blood came out 2005 was yeah. when uh, paul thomas anderson became a father uh, so i'm assuming that was around the time he was writing the film or reading the book oil or researching on this because the, it takes off from a book but then goes in a completely different direction so yeah, if you yeah, see yeah. all the movies after this then they go into the search for a ideal family space like punch drunk yeah there will be blood yeah. the master also in the master now coming to the master you're looking at lancaster yeah. dodd played by an incredible philip seymour hoffman uh he also has a son who he is not happy with who he is not satisfied with and then freddy kind of takes that place played by uh, joaquin phoenix takes that place so that film again is not just about freddy's search for a father figure it's also no. lancaster dodd's search for a son who would uh, yeah. take his business and his legacy forward freddy quill is not even looking for a father he is yeah. a wanderer untethered how, how do you tell a story of a meandering character yeah. so he just happens to like the theme of chance coming back uh, from magnolia into the master he just by chance goes into a ship which happens to be uh, the ship at which lancaster dodd is with his entire family all he's looking for a job not right. a person the moment the lancaster dodd puts his eye eyes on freddy all of a sudden he feels like this is the person i can mold uh, uh into into the image that i want it's like it's almost like a father saying okay i know what my son or my daughter will be uh, in future so i'm since childhood i'm going to mold them mold. into that also freddy quell is so malleable he's rigid in a few ways he has a few things but um, lancaster dot in that fabulous scene where uh, they sit down and he uh, tries his kind of scientology style yeah. um hypno- yeah. not hypnosis what is the w- word i'm looking for it's an auditing scene uh, the process is auditing processing in that processing scene between lancaster dot and freddy quell uh, uh because this guy lancaster dot has been doing this for so long the master mm-hmm. he's been he's met so many different people he looks at freddy and he realizes that this guy needs a tether 
he just needs yeah. to belong all of this stuff is self sustenance all this walls that he's created around himself is just self sustenance he's just trying to protect himself because also there's also this parallel commentary about the post traumatic stress disorder uh, after for world war soldiers who had just returned yeah. and then they had nothing to do because you yeah. see that scene in the beginning and they're getting counseling and people are telling them oh you can now do this and you can now do that you can have this kind of job and that kind of job but for a man who is so broken because he's killed so many different people he's had no female yeah. contact he's lived with men for years and years on ships uh how how do you just pick up a job you cannot pick up a job Absolutely. so the film is also commenting about that i mean i did not like master because i did not like the people and i was just like Ugh. but uh hawking phoenix as is his his physical acting abilities in uh, both yeah. the paul thomas anderson films that he has done the master and inherent vice the physical acting that he does he becomes the character not just by being a good actor and i was just listening to an interview of uh, tarantino and paul thomas anderson together and they were saying that the best uh, special effect a director can have is a good actor That's and hawking phoenix just he just brings it and if you've seen the master you will kind of dislike yourself for liking the joker and being like this is joaquin's best work it is not that is the mm-hmm. genesis of joker that is where probably what is the name of the director todd phillips yeah 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 that's where he probably saw what hawking is capable of doing for this character that he had envisioned in his mind and he just took it and just injected it with dizzying lights fancy bright lights and made joker but if you really want to see a character that is fighting against uh, everything that the world expects you to be while battling their own inner demons you have to watch the master there are some scenes which are in the master which are in the joker with hawking phoenix so okay the joker i know we're supposed to be talking about father son this thing but <laughs> spare me joker mein ek scene hai uh, opening scene where uh, hawking is dressed as joker and he's standing outside a store and he's he has a sign in his hand and he's trying to attract attention to a going to a sale and some kids then take his stuff and then run away and then we kind of feel bad for him a very similar scene is in the master when he's when he's standing outside uh and uh, uh, he's on a f- on footpath and he's handing out flyers you know people are not taking him seriously he's trying to get everybody's attention it is the same energy it is the same emotion it is the same scene but injected with a little bit more color you know obvious manipulation in the joker what do you think i uh, definitely there some of the especially the performance of uh uh freddy quill is very much reflected in joker and i think both actor and director thaw like must have taken it this like this was, must be a conscious decision may not be who knows uh but but definitely there is there are resemblance i agree with that scene there especially that flyers selling uh, distributing the flyers outside it's the same it's scene it's very much it's, it's almost the same scene yeah what i love what i love about uh, just to round it up Uh, on the master it's a film about a man uh, who has dif- drifted from the traditional path and has the film in terms of uh, storytelling also meanders like yeah. film has no plot character is the plot yeah. and on top of it this is like the most uh, the least accessible paul thomas anderson film uh, the beauty however of the film is that it ends where freddy and the audience us comes to term that being a drifter is his destiny freddie himself convinces that oh if i'm with lancaster dot there might be the cause might have some sort of a meaning and i'll have find my way this is the family but as he moves along and he finds the shallowness in this entire cause yeah he drifts away from that also when he's loved too much and when he's given too much attention yeah. it also it 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 repels him from that yeah. uh, very thing that he's looking for so he again drifts apart and ultimately he ends where he uh, ends where he he belongs like uh, naked with a woman having sex uh, drinking alcohol but then you see his again physicality he's become weaker he's become smaller and weaker. on the other hand yeah. uh, the master has become stronger he's he's he looks healthy when we meet him at the end and yeah. uh, you know that's also like a parasitic relationship that they've had with each other the master never yeah. truly really cared for him and just kind of sucked him dry for what he needed okay so now we're going to come to the second theme because then uh, the remaining uh, pda film uh, with films which is inherent vice and a uh, phantom thread i did not notice the father son equation but the next one is the maternal figure as a catalyst yeah. for conflict the maternal figure as a catalyst for conflict 
and quickly we'll go through the ones uh, when you want to start with this one hard eight uh john just lost his mother uh that's that starts the plot the moment he loses his mother and the movie starts all of a sudden there has to be another woman which has to fill the void and yeah. he ha- haphazardly and quickly marries this girl who has who he has met so there is this constant need to have a maternal figure in the li- uh, in his life not given much uh, importance as much as the other theme the father figure theme in yeah. hard eight but it is, is the catalyst it is the call but to it action is definitely um the yeah. second one boogie nights is also very very obvious the character played by mark wahlberg who goes on to become dirk diggler which by the way also is a short film that's available short for film. free on youtube the dirk diggler story If you guys want to see the genesis of Boogie Nights, one of the most famous Paul Thomas Anderson films, and the only film that you can actually watch in India, it's on Netflix. Watch the short film, The Dirk Diggler Story. It is a more kind of ridiculous, funny, silly, tongue firmly in cheek short film, which is kind of ridiculing the people who are making um, films in the porn uh, porn industry. But then in Boogie Nights, he takes that and he goes into the humanity of the people. Yeah. the dog diggler yeah. story is a surface of uh, look at these silly people doing these silly low budget shoots but boogie nights is the behind the scenes who are these people and what it is that they yeah. why is it that they do what they do and again yeah. here uh, dog diggler before he becomes dog diggler mark wahlberg his mother throws him out of the house she is abusive she is emotionally manipulative and that again becomes the catalyst for his transformation when he's kicked that out of the house. his transformation another big story in the film uh, a subplot is uh, julian moore fighting yes. for uh, the custody of her kids if the if you're talking about porn industry the people who are most affected at the same time uh, most exploited are the women in that entire industry uh, but then we realize that even a mother figure has a different shade Uh, if you're if you're a mother inside a porn industry then coming to the next one magnolia magnolia um i mean magnolia is mostly about men abandoning their children and treating their children badly because the mothers in the film are good people so moving on skipping magnolia entirely here uh, move on to punch drunk love now this is the first time we talk about punch drunk love and it is adam sandler like maybe you've seen him people watched uncut gems and i was one of those people who watched uncut gems and i was like adam sandler is capable of doing this watch punch drunk love to also see adam sandler is capable of doing this he is incredible as barry yeah. in this film a ridiculously fucked up character who has like what seven sisters and yeah. uh, his sisters have kind of ganged up on him ridiculed him his whole life ridiculed because he's him. the only boy and they didn't know any better they love him but they didn't know how to treat him and that's what has given him severe personality disorder and that's all the women not necessarily a catalyst for the story but the catalyst for the character catalyst uh, for the character yeah. the 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 anxieties that he has the inhibitions that he has the low confidence uh, when he is speaking with the uh, with women comes yeah. from the way he's been treated by his sister we get only one scene and we understand what his past must have been yeah. like yeah yeah we get one demo <laughs> how scene. his group Yeah, that's it. I have saw saw or heard an interview of Paul Thomas Anderson, and he said this entire film is just Popeye. The film is Popeye. Yeah, there's a song also from uh, Popeye, which we'll come there's to. There's a later. song in the pop, uh, in the movie also, but it's like this character who doesn't we you think is not good enough to put up a fight, but then all of a sudden something will happen, and he becomes this uh, anger-filled, raging uh, maniac. It goes all out, and then again comes back to comes the same deflated. timid uh, deflated uh, uh, person so you don't know which one you are uh, you're going to face yeah. uh, at what amount uh, at what time which yeah. i did not realize it uh, when i saw it for the first time but when i heard the interview when i saw the film again especially the last scene when he confronts uh, philip seymour hoffman's character is almost like popoy uh, facing brook wow so it became See, i didn't i didn't i didn't realize this until this moment i know there's that really random song from the popoy films but this is incredible yeah but the but the film is exactly i think is popoy kind of like a romantic comedy but not a romantic comedy like not a romantic the traditional comedy. sense yeah. of the word exactly again uh, throughout his career uh, trying to subvert genres trying to change the way the narrative fiction is supposed to take place so for me it's 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 a very unnerving film you are always at the edge of your seat you don't know what this character is going to do yeah. throughout the film there are laughters is 
hilarious, but it's, yeah, very funny. They're, they're all nervous laughters. Correct, correct, correct. Uh, now coming which, more. Haan, which bolo, bolo. then leads to there will be blood. Yes. Now you have a very interesting right. theory about the maternal conflict in There Will Be Blood, which is not obvious be at all because there are no women in There Will Be Blood. It is an out and out masculine uh, film. There is all male, all male characters. I mean, there are there is one female character. Uh, H.W.'s uh, wife. H.W.'s yeah. Who later the the kid who grows on to yeah yeah. Yeah, Mary Sunday. But apart from that, there is no single woman. And I had read a lot of reviews criticizing the fact that there oh, are there no are women. no women in uh, There Will Be Blood. In fact, the there obvious was explanation, one... the obvious explanation of the lack of women is the time period that the film is set in. It was set in a time where yeah. women were not allowed to come out and make decisions and yeah. run businesses or do anything. But you are saying that there is another reason why there are no women. There is another reason, I believe, because uh, this is the first film that in which the entire film is from the point of view of the lead character. There, yeah. There's a couple of scenes in which uh, Daniel Plainview is not present there, especially when the Eli Sunday attacks his own father. If you if you give that much liberty to Paul Thomas Anderson, that one uh, scene, there will be yeah, that one scene. Uh, so there will be blood is his first first person narrative. That means the entire film takes place from the point of view of uh, Daniel Plainview. You wouldn't say that about you, Punch Drunk Love. No, because we see what Philip Seymour Hoffman's uh, characters are up to and right. him and the girls and everything. So that's there's right. an omniscient uh, narrator in the film. Whereas in right. There Will Be Blood, everything happens. We have from the start till the end. We are with. It's all with uh, Daniel. Plainview. Yeah. Daniel Plainview hates everyone. We have no idea uh, about his past. Even when we spend time with him, we have no idea. The way the film is edited, we have no idea what's happening in between the period uh, we are not seeing anything on screen. Right. The best example that I can give is, is he a hero or is he a farce? Uh, when he falls in the well that he was digging, his right. leg breaks and then he heroically puts himself and he on the back uh, slides across the ground. Now it cuts straight to uh, the place where he uh, he's getting a transaction done. How far yeah. is that place? We have no idea. If he's, let's say, he made a four day long journey to get to that place, he's a hero. But what if that place was only an hour long away? Yeah. Just across the hill. So hiding that information builds that mystery around that character. Hmm. And exactly in that way, the people who might have been involved in Daniel Plainview's past is completely hidden. Hmm. So when a woman asks him for the first time in the film, and that this happens around the 25th minute in the film, when she asks uh, Mr. Plainview, what about your wife? your wife? Yeah. He says she died in childbirth. Correct. Now, at a face value, you can take it. But when he's asked again by his brother, did you not get married? Did you not feel like getting married? He outright avoids this question and goes to the heart of it. They're saying he hates people. So he's constantly avoiding any question that is related to women, be it wife or a companion. So mm -hmm. a person who is outright avoiding even the presence of women in his, uh, in his life makes no sense to put a woman um, in the film. For him, women are almost non-existing in his so, life. So, because that's what PTA wants you to feel. He wants you to feel the emptiness uh, of his yeah. heart, the the yeah. the absolute edges, sharp edges of his personality, which have yeah. been shaped like that because he's had no women in his life. No, uh, to he goes soften, to a brothel. To soften him. He, soften him. He goes to a brothel and doesn't indulge in anything. Absence of women is part of his character. Correct. If you put a women, you are revealing that part of his character. And that's the that part uh, Anderson wants to uh, consciously avoid because he's hiding certain information to create that mysterious aura around the character. The other metaphor to him saying that his wife died in childbirth is also uh, the other thing that he's doing to the earth, to the land. He's um, yeah. taking the oil and killing the land leaving it barren probably that's Absolutely. the other metaphor that you can look that's at a, that's other metaphor you can look at yeah that the land is dying in childbirth i really enjoyed this film's uh, agnostic themes also but well, not oh. not really themes but like agnostic like just kind of harping on about that how plain yeah, view yeah, is yeah, yeah. plain view is god there's this there's this really nice scene when i think they are uh, inaugurating a new well and hw is oh. standing on one side and i think uh, mary sunday the little girl is standing on one side and she's wearing a white frock and that seems mm -hmm. kind of and you know he's standing in the middle hw is wearing a black i think 
suit and this kid is wearing a white frock and they're only kids but that it over it's foreshadowing that maybe yeah. you know, they're going to grow up and get married as bride and groom get married almost but yeah. in the center is uh, plain view he's kind of the priest in that frame so in that moment he's also become the god he's got an a well that's going to produce oil he's the priest officiating his son's marriage so he's kind of really desperate to control everything and that's when he that's why he becomes so frustrated with hw's physical uh, situation because he cannot control it he cannot control that yeah. the fact that his son can't cure him and that's why he's angry absolutely absolutely the fact that he is almost like a godly figure in this uh, self created universe and hence uh, eli sunday who's almost like a counterpart of him yes. he has the same oratory skills he has the same yes. influence over others that uh, daniel had so he finds him a direct threat uh, and that's why I'm, at the end of the film is he's almost like saying that i am the third revelation i'm the third revelation so in revelation. A, in a, in, a, in, a, in a sense like he is announcing uh, himself as a god uh, you know and, this is also a comment on the, the american history of the time not that i know a whole lot about the late 1800s and early 1900s uh, economy of america but like i imagine a man who's found land upon land full of oil and uh, has drilled that oil and has sold that oil was um, treated as a god because he just became so rich and so important to the american economy so i assume these men would have a god complex also oh definitely were, definitely so we've totally meandered from our uh, theme here but uh, <laughs> good conversation uh, yeah but the maternal but the maternal figure then after there will be blood is constantly there uh, even in the master i'm like especially in the master freddy is traumatized uh, by what happened to his mother Now we're coming to the next theme. This is going to be a six-hour-long video. Now we come to the next theme, which is uh, chosen families. Moving on to our next theme, sexual promiscuity, mm -hmm. and it's never a good thing. Okay, so Are we doing patterns, dude? Ray, are we? We are doing. We are doing. Uh, archaeologists. digging kar rahe hain abhi when pta's new film comes out to find all these patterns yeah, in his new film it will be so interesting to see <laughs> ki kya kya repeat ho raha hai 